Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by... Yuletide Office Solutions, locally owned and family operated, offering office supplies and furniture, office design services, school supplies and more. The Yuletide team proudly supports the Bartlett Area Chamber of Commerce and WKNO. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. District Attorney Amy Wyrick, tonight on Behind the Headlines. <laughs> I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I am joined tonight by District Attorney Amy Wyrick for Shelby County. Thanks, thanks for being here. Yes, thanks for having me. Along with Bill Drees, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. We'll talk about a you know, range of issues today, some specific things to the best we can and some bigger issues, but certainly a big issue right now nationally is, is this, uh, the spotlight on police shootings of people by police. Uh, sure. It started with, with in Baltimore, Ferguson, it's, it's a big issue. And sadly, probably it'll happen again in Memphis that a police officer at some point in time will have to you know, uh, shoot someone in, in, in the line of duty. Without talking about specifics, I mean, how would that process be handled in an ideal world? And then we'll talk about the, the real world and the restraints and the laws as they are now. But if you could look forward and say, you know, what your office would do to investigate a shooting, what the police department should do, is there a role for a civilian review board in a very theoretical kind of future sense? Give me your thoughts on that issue and sure. how it should be handled. Um, historically, in our city, when a and we'll just take the Memphis Police Department as an example. If a Memphis police officer uh, shot and killed someone in the line of duty, it was the Memphis Police Department that investigated that incident. Uh, they prepared a report and they delivered that report to our office. We then reviewed the facts and the evidence and matching those with the law of the state of Tennessee, then made a decision as to whether there could be prosecution. It, uh, because of this national conversation and because of a lot of changes in philosophy, it became important to me and our office that an independent agency be the one that come in and investigate those law enforcement involved shootings. Uh, so that was the, the historical background really on why the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding, was signed among Mark Gwynn, the director of TBI, Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. Uh, yes, Tennessee yeah. Bureau of Investigation, the police director and Sheriff Oldham and myself, that in the unfortunate event that an officer has to shoot and kill someone or does shoot and kill someone, uh, we have TBI come in and investigate that and then deliver their findings to the District Attorney General's office. And is, is that, in my again, my kind of hypothetical sense, sure. is that your ideal situation? I or think, is that the best at your disposal right now? I think having an independent agency is an important piece to that. Is that the ideal? Um, I don't know, you know, it's, but independent investigation, yes, is, is critical and crucial. The other, you know, frustration to having TBI come in is under the law currently in the state of Tennessee, unlike a Memphis Police Department file or a Shelby County Sheriff's Office file, uh, TBI files are never open for public disclosure. Yeah. And that's frustrating to the right. public. And we'll get into that a little bit. Bill, we'll get into that a little bit with you. Okay. What, let me, again, in a kind of more theoretical sense, the, a civilian review board, do you see that as an important part of this kind of process? Um, I don't, because quite frankly, the civilian review process is the grand jury and the the eyes and ears of the district attorney general's office mm -hmm. and then if we get to the point of a trial like is going on right now in Baltimore uh, the 12 men and women of that jury that will make that ultimate That's decision. That's the, the civilians who are in the review mm -hmm. process. Okay, Bill. Um, as we're taping this, the, the day before this taping um, we had a filing in the Darius Stewart case. Your mm -hmm. office, you filed a suit to open the TBI file in the Darius Stewart uh, <coughs> investigation by the TBI. And the attorney for Officer Connor Schilling, the police officer involved in that shooting, uh, filed a notice yesterday that his client will not be seeking an appeal of that <coughs> ruling. Um, what does that mean? Do we do we play out the stay by Chancellor Newsom until the 15th or 
doesn't become open sooner than that. We're going to do the best we can. So what has been going on since uh, November 3rd when we learned that the grand jury returned a no true bill and the petition was filed by me in Chancery Court to open this file? We have been working with uh, the chancellor and, and others to create a process. This is the first time this has ever been done. Um, and so it's new territory for all of us. There are pieces of information in any investigative file that must be and should be redacted for a variety of reasons. There may be uh, legislative things that have to be redacted. There may be personal information that out of the interests of witnesses and uh, public safety, we want to redact that information. So we've been working with the chancellor and going through that redaction process. Right now we are making sure that and double checking and triple checking that our system, our website, the Shelby County District Attorney General's website can handle this report, this voluminous report and uh, the videos that go along with it. I would also like to give uh, the mother and father and the, the lawyers for Darius Stewart and the lawyer for the officer an opportunity to come in and view that file if they want to before it's made open to the entire community and, and the entire nation, really. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there remains a question, as I understand it, about whether this remains a, a public file forever or whether at some point it should be closed. And I think Chancellor Newsom has said he will look at that and basically uh, see where things are in February. Yes, that. that's correct. That he wants to gauge kind of the, you know, see where we are in terms of how many viewers there have been to the site, um, what kind of issues have arisen since the, re from the time of the release until that February deadline. But yes, that's mm -hmm. correct. The state law in this says, says the TBI files are closed unless there is a court order or a subpoena from mm -hmm. a, a court on this. This is the first time, as you said, that this has really been done, that we've really gotten into court and said, okay, this is how it's gonna work. Is this, is this a model for things to come? Well, I don't know. I, I guess it's one of those situations that it, um, it seemed like the right thing to do given uh, the answer that we got back from the grand jury. You know, bear in mind, if the grand jury had indicted uh, this information would not become public until we went into court and began prosecuting and pursuing um, closure in the criminal justice system. But given the fact that the grand jury returned a no true bill, it was important to our office that uh, we get as much of the facts and information out there because it, it didn't seem right that the public be um, limited in what they know about that night just because the TBI investigated the case. If the Memphis Police Department had investigated it, the file would be open for public review. So right. I guess if this um, achieves those goals of um, giving the public all of the information that was available to, to our office, the information that was available to those involved in the case, and if it um, you know, helps move the needle in terms of public transparency and understanding the processes, I hope it will become a model. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you think that um, what happens with the opening of this file will have an impact on changing the state law in regard to TBI files? Is, is, is it something the legislature might take a look at? Perhaps. In yeah, you know, there's been a little bit of chatter from various representatives that they do want to look at uh, the the inability to release TBI files as compared to other law enforcement files and that strict language of the statute. So I would imagine, you know, there are going to be lawmakers that, that look to this and see Will you, see how it plays out. I mean, you do some amount of time, I'm talking to leg legislators, say, hey, we'd like to get this law changed. This law. Is this an, a, an issue uh, where you would like to, where you act actively lobby, for lack of a better word, legislators on making changes to how these kind of cases are handled? Um, I've, yes. I mean, I'm not sure how much active lobbying I will yeah. do, but it'll certainly be the opinion of our DA's office, certainly not speaking for the DA's conference, but for the 30th Judicial District that I represent, um, that in the case of law enforcement involved deaths, yeah. that those files should be open for public review. How, how much does uh, public pressure. I mean, it, it, on the national level that this issue is so in a spotlight, there are protests in Memphis. How much does public pressure influence how you handle a case like this? 
Uh, public pressure, very little. Um, listening to the public and interacting with the public and having those relationships in the community is helpful yeah. and impactful and makes a difference. But public pressure, no, because anything and everything that I do, anything and everything that our office does has to be guided by and governed by the law of yeah. the state of Tennessee. You, uh, again, with this issue of, of, of police shootings, uh, it, it has come to light in part states that have body cameras or then you've got dash cameras. Memphis is, is Wharton, Mayor Wharton had tried to roll out pretty quickly a whole, everybody's going to have body cams. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe your office asked him to slow that down. I think you're supportive of body cameras. Yes. But you need it slowed down. Why? Yes, so that our office can prepare for this. Um, it will fall on the shoulders of the 106 prosecutors in our office and the dozens of investigators that we have to locate and organize and keep up with all of these body cameras for the rest of time because it's our responsibility to turn this over to defense and to keep it attached to a certain case file. So, so and how will those cameras work in the sense that, I mean, in a, if, a, if a police officer works an eight hour shift, will mm -hmm. he or she come back and download yep. eight hours of, yes. of video, everything? Yes. And so it's almost as if a prosecutor then on Monday morning has to go back and relive. Right every hour of every shift from the day before. And we don't have the staff to do that. Well, well, and you, will only, you will only look at it if there's some sort of charge or some sort of thing that might come up later. I mean, you're not gonna look at every eight hour shift, right? Well, I mean, or are you? It, it, it depends it, because yeah. if there is, it, you know, it, it, so much of it is gonna depend on the um, categorizing and the um, specificity with which an officer logs that tape and how they categorize it. And so it may be that six months down the road, we realize that a certain tape from a certain shift is now vital. It's gonna to be too late to go back and get it at that six month mark sure. because of the MPD retention policy. So it's going to be in our best interest and in the interest of justice to do everything we can to capture as much as we can in the beginning. Really? Mm -hmm. I, I'm blown away by this. I, I apparently have not been following this carefully. So again, an officer goes out on an eight-hour shift. And not just one officer. Yeah, you well, got... I'm just doing the one, and then we're going to do we're right. going to multiply it. Goes right. out an eight-hour shift. You know, has a traffic stop. Uh, you know, responds to a burglar alarm. Quiet night. Comes back. Downloads that eight hours. Your office, from a legal and, and technical, and just mm -hmm. you want to get your hands on that, regardless of the fact that nothing of great significance happened except to the person who got the traffic. But it's our duty as prosecutors to make sure there's nothing exculpatory right. that might be on that tape and it's our duty and, as prosecutors and to make sure. How many police are out on? No, oh, I have no idea. Hundreds. 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 Mm -hmm. it's, per shift. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that, 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 that's why you want to slow this down. Yes. You've got to figure out just, I mean, even the technical issues and the organizational issues of storing all this stuff and tracking it all is a major bureaucratic kind exactly. of Exactly. Uh, and so we endeavor. had someone in last week who trained 60 or so people in our office. They were there yeah. for about two or three days doing that. Um, and we are doing it. We've pretty much taken yeah. one of our top prosecutors and pulled him off all assignments and said, focus on nothing but right. this. But it is going to take a little bit of time. And you, you, the body cameras will roll out? If, if, if we're, you... we're hoping the first of the year that we okay. can be ready. But every day there's right. more and more issues that come up. Those issues aside, in, mm -hmm. you're, in, you're in favor of this? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, and we've made that very clear from the beginning that in, in the use of the body-worn cameras and the in-car cameras will be a good thing for the criminal justice system, but we just have to make sure uh, that we're prepared yeah. so that it works properly. Yeah, yeah. And what about the public record issues, But I mean, from a newspaper point well, of view, but from the public right. point of view? So right. if I say, you know, I get pulled over for that 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 uh, traffic ticket and not I just want to protest something about it again we're not talking about something to the level of a shooting or something right. am I as a citizen going to have the right sure. to request a copy of that video sure and that's what's been crippling to so many other major jurisdictions that yeah. have gone down this body camera road I think it's Seattle that originally had 35 additional officers hired and staffed to do nothing but deal with the public records requests, and yeah. they finally got to the point that it was unworkable, and I believe have just decided to post everything on YouTube. But, but that, there's public records requests that our office will yeah. receive as well, and that's going to be stifling. I, I mean, I'm, I'm hard, I just, a couple more things on this. It's so interesting because let's say that I'm a disgruntled employee and I want to make a public records request on somebody that I don't like, sure. or an ex-husband, ex-wife. I mean, you can get all these, these really difficult an invasive scenario exactly. about this being public record and yeah, I want to get an embarrassing photo of, of my ex-wife getting a ticket or something like that. Right. I mean, it's really 
So there's a lot of ramifications. There's to this a lot that, of ramifications, that, and the other responsibility that we're going to have in terms of releasing video is, what do we do with footage of you know deceased people? What do we do with yeah. faces of children? What do we do with you know, all types of images that an officer deals with on a day-to-day -day basis, how do we make sure that we're serving the public and protecting the public at the same time? So do you time? have to put together policies, or is that defined in the, the, the legislature, or is the legislature going to have to come in and define some of these the things? The legislature has not yeah. said anything on this. This is all going to have to be mapped out and worked out and ironed out here in Shelby County yeah. to the best of our ability. Okay. Yeah. Bill. Um, back to the discussion about, about the TBI handling uh, fatal police encounters or, or deaths in, mm -hmm. in, in custody on this. Um, it, some of the legislative committee hearings in, in Nashville have involved the police chiefs from Nashville and Knoxville in particular, who, who actually disagreed with that approach. They said, yep. we think we ought to handle it, and we think we ought to handle it because the TBI records are not open and some other reasons too. So uh, uh, do we still have a debate going on we here do. about it? We do. Mm -hmm. We have a very uh, healthy debate going on. You know, in the rural jurisdictions, anytime there is a homicide, whether it is law enforcement or lay citizen, it's typically the TBI that comes in and investigates that because rural jurisdictions don't have uh, the number of law enforcement officers that we do in the big four, mm -hmm. as we're called. Um, and so it's really a conversation among the big four chiefs and the big four district attorneys. And um, I'm kind of out there on an island among the big four. Mm -hmm. um, so it, is the legislature going to resolve this or, or is this going to be a matter of we have an agreement here, the other jurisdictions can make up their own mind about whether they want to enter into that kind of pact? Yeah, and I don't know. I, I think it's mm -hmm. too soon to tell how much um, traction there's going to be in the legislature to mandate that these types of uh, homicides are investigated by the TBI or you know, some other agency that the legislature may Mm -hmm. designate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another national conversation, moving on a little bit, uh, is about gun violence and, yes. and the number of, of mass shootings. However, it, people define it differently. Some say <clears throat> four people killed in a, in a day, and there have been, by that definition, you know, 350. I mean, basically more than one a day that, right. That, right now. Huge conversation. Um, what are your, what is your take, I don't even know, in terms of access to guns, access to semi-automatic weapons right now? Are the laws in Tennessee um, appropriate from your point of view? Um, they've gotten better over the last couple of years in terms of tougher sentences and bigger hammers for us to swing against convicted felons and those that use guns for certain types of crimes. But when you're talking about just plain old vanilla unlawful possession of a weapon, yeah. um, it can be anything from a C misdemeanor to an A misdemeanor at the best. Um, and so... And is that enough? No, it's not. Yeah. You know, in a lot of jurisdictions, just being in possession of that weapon uh, ramps you up to a felony level. Right. right. But it's a, a debate that has many, many moving parts to it. Here in Shelby County, particularly in the city of Memphis, the problem is not necessarily the guns, of course. It's the guns being in the hands of those who want to commit violent crimes right. with those guns and right. the, the readily, how readily accessible they are to that group of individuals yeah. that want to harm others. You're off, I mean, I don't even know how to ask the question, but when you see some of these mass shootings, these, you know, the horrible things in, uh, I'm going to set aside San Bernardino for a second, but on the college campuses and the, the, the workplace ones and so on, the Planned Parenthood, mm -hmm. uh, you look at that and think what? You know, what can be done to stop that? Right. Do, you, do you have an answer? Um, no. Uh, you no. know, so much of it is, uh, I think this year we are on track. We've had 138 homicides. Uh, at the end of last year, we had 148 homicides. So God willing, hopefully we'll end the year with less right. homicides than we did last year. But it's still far too many people losing right. their life. And the majority of those are because of guns in yeah. the hands of the wrong people. Um, you know, trying to right a, an injustice that they believe has happened or yeah. trying to just get their revenge. Yeah. Um, too much of it is gang related. Too much of it is uh, young individual against young individual. And yeah. 
Um, I don't know what the answer is, but it is something that we've got to work on from both a suppression and an enforcement level, which yeah. we do a very good job of. Right. But there also has to be a conversation with uh, particularly our young people that getting a gun from your big brother or getting a gun from your cousin and settling a fight with somebody when they come out of school yeah. is not the way to go about things. There's a, a national conversation, and, and we've talked about it on the show uh, a year or two ago, um, about some shifts in the way sentencing works. So that, that I think there are very few people who think that, it, you know, in a murder, in a, a violent crime, that anything but, you know, harshest punishment should go forward. But this idea that, that there are mandatory minimums and, and too harsh a sentencing for lesser crimes, some drug-related that aren't violent drug-related, some, you know, possession-type things. Your take on that, the shift away, and you see it in a lot of conservative states, you see it in a lot mm -hmm. of um, law, you know, traditionally law and order Republicans who are saying, look, one, it's costing our state way too much. Right. We're about to incarcerate and we can't afford it. And right. two, a lot of evangelical Republicans saying this is not, you know, we believe in, in you know, people uh, who commit lower crimes having a chance to redeem themselves. Your take on that shift, and would you like to be able to focus more on these violent gun-related crimes and not be so bogged down maybe in lesser crimes? Yes. Yes, and for the most part, we aren't that bogged down in the lesser crimes. Uh, about a year ago, Governor Haslam put together a task force of individuals from across the state, uh, and I was honored to serve on that commission. And what he tasked us with was, tell me how we can best use our dollars in the mm -hmm. state to make sure that the worst of the worst offenders are receiving the punishment that they deserve and that anybody and everybody else that gets crossways with the criminal justice system, are we doing everything within our power uh, to make sure they can get on the right path if they choose to. Yeah. And so here in Shelby County for many, many years, we've had a very productive and successful drug court. That's the reason for that drug court. It makes no sense to lock up somebody that has a cocaine addiction. Right. If you're locked up for cocaine in the state of Tennessee, it's because you're a violent drug trafficker right. and we're tired of you supplying the drug to our kids. But how does that reconcile with, and I think you got a little heat when, uh, when the, the terrible incident at Kroger in the parking lot, whatever that was a year ago or so, I mm -hmm. don't have a good sense of time today, um, that not everyone went to jail for the rest of their lives. You know, and people who saw that video right. and saw that and were so angered by it and frightened by it. Thought, sure. And you and Mayor Wharton and from the police office were here. And, you know, there's this visceral sense that I want to lock all of them up. I never want them out again. They're dangerous and they're just terrible people. Right. And not all of them got locked up for the rest of their lives. They did. How, how, do, how do you reconcile that visceral anger that people had about an incident like that with this idea that you can't just lock them up for the rest of their lives? Sure. Well, you have to look at the individual. You have to look at the person who's accused of the crime and the crime that they're accused of committing. And mm -hmm. those, with the exception of one, were all juveniles yeah. that had never been in trouble before. Yeah. So are we really, as a society, prepared to say that we're going to send a 17-year-old off to prison for the rest of their life for standing there and watching a right. fight? Right. Um, you know, we had a, a child caught up in that, a juvenile caught up in that, that was a salutatorian, I believe, of their class. Yeah. I mean, these were, they were in the wrong place. They didn't do what we want them to do as a civilized society. Right. But hopefully, because of the punishment that they did receive, they've learned that lesson. Yeah. Um, but I think we really, as a, as a state and as a nation, have to look to um, are we using our dollars in the in the smartest way to to lock up the worst of the worst and do what we can to help people uh, get on the right path if they want to and if they choose to. Okay, just a couple minutes left, Bill. Yeah. Um, l let's talk about the the gang effort because I think this past year we've seen more of the no gang zones that that, yes. that we've rolled out at two apartment complexes in Frazier mm -hmm. and also the area near what used to be the Dixie Homes Public Housing Project, which is now Legends Park right. subdivision. Um, how have ha what are those areas like? They are doing great. Um, we, in fact, we just had a multi-agency gang unit board of directors meeting on Monday and we got an update from our officers, the, the boots on the ground. Um, from one of those apartment complexes, we've been told by the apartment manager that the gang is gone. That they're, now, that doesn't mean that there's not other issues going on in those communities, but the, the calls for service have gone up. 
which is a good thing because that means there's increased trust with law enforcement, with the police department, and the number of crimes that are being committed in those areas have gone down. And most important to us on the board of directors is the what we hear from the people that live in that community, what we hear from the retired citizens and the hardworking uh, men and women and the kids that just want to go to school in peace and, and be safe, they notice a difference. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the reason we file those injunctions and, and work tirelessly on that front. And, and to be clear, one of those two apartment complexes in Frazier was described as literally the headquarters of the gang. So you weren't getting calls from it, but that wasn't a good no, <laughs> people were too afraid to call. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's kind of a hard thing when you when you tell you know individuals in the community that calls for service increasing is a good thing, but it is because it means that trust is being built back up with law enforcement. Let me do this. I get not enough time to talk about it. When you look at a San Bernardino shooting, a terrorism at the local level, where it's not somebody who's working for Arcata, working for ISIS, it's just radicalized individuals in the community. From a district attorney point of view, do you look at that and what do you, what do you think? I mean, because that it, that could happen anywhere, and some not that it will happen everywhere, but it could happen anywhere. It could, and I think it's why it's it's so important that the community understand we all have to work together. And if you if you see something in your neighborhood, if you right. see something in your community uh, that makes you sit up straight and 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 you know makes you wonder if there's something some criminal activity afoot, pick up the phone and call the police. They'd much rather you call and be wrong about yeah. your suspicions than figure out after the tragedy that maybe something could have been done to avoid it. All right. We leave it there. Thank you very much, Attorney All General. Right. Thank uh, you. All. District Attorney, excuse me, Amy <laughs> Weirich. I gave you a promotion there. Uh, Bill Drees, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week. Yuletide Office Solutions, locally owned and family operated, offering office supplies and furniture, office design services, school supplies, and more. The Yuletide team proudly supports the Bartlett Area Chamber of Commerce and WKNO.